Sir Thomas Leung. Um, uh, Thomas is, uh, and I, have, we've been working together for well over a decade. And I must say, uh, he is one of the world leaders in my mind of uh, patient-centered care, uh, both for people who have suffered a stroke and then also for preserving, um, preserving brain function over time. He's got an extraordinary practice in Hong Kong. He is widely respected, widely sought after, both as a, as a, a care provider, as a teacher, and I don't know how he finds time to do it, but he also is a very effective administrative leader and a, a researcher. Um, and um, I, I don't have time. I, I want to make sure we get to Thomas's talk to summarize all of his contributions. But I do want to talk in particular about how innovative he's been, both uh, in pushing forward acute stroke treatment. So in particular uh, interventions in the acute setting of stroke and really making a difference in how stroke patients uh, fare in Hong Kong. And then also developing programs for present prevention. And the particular one he's gonna talk about today is one that we really hatched together. Thomas was part of the sort of conception of the whole notion of brain health that became the, became the McCann Center early on. And we were thrilled when uh, he was a, uh, able to launch uh, a partner study and a partner center in in Hong Kong that really uh, uh, embodies the, our vision for developing primary prevention for primary care. So uh, without further ado, uh, I'm going to turn this over to uh, Professor Leong and um, thank him very much for being a part of today's seminar. Um, thank you very much for the invitation and introduction, Jonathan. It's my pleasure to share with you the progress of our Bring Health cohort in Hong Kong. Um, before we go directly to our findings, let me first explain the burden of brain disease in our region and why a population-based Brain Health cohort is important here. Uh, in this world map, you can appreciate that more than half of the world's population is in fact living within the green circle where I am now. And in these 19 countries, many are facing increasing prevalence of risk factors for brain diseases like hypertension, diabetes, obesity, smoking, depression, and environmental pollution. Because elderly harbor these risks more frequently, the problem is magnified by aging population. For example, as shown in the figure on the right, 36% of people in China will be aged 60 or above by 2050. Any effort to alleviate this brain disease tsunami will be a significant contribution to mankind. So why do I call it a tsunami? It was in the newspaper headline two weeks ago about the latest global burden of neurological diseases. In this comprehensive study led by the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation, the burden of brain and nervous system diseases is much greater than previously understood with these conditions affecting 43% of the world's population in 2021, that is 3.4 billion individuals. If you can read the small prints, brain and nervous system disease is now the top contributor to the global disease burden, way ahead of cardiovascular diseases. If we take a closer look of the breakdown, stroke ranks number one and dementia ranks number two, for both high-income Asia-Pacific region, like Japan, Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, and Hong Kong, and in East and Southeast Asia, like in Thailand, Indonesia, India, and China. In terms of people living with dementia, all studies consistently projected an exponential growth in the coming decades. But at any time, Asia will take up more than half of the global burden. 38 millions just six years later, and 67 millions by 2050. Overall, population aging happens on all continents, and the total number of dementia patients will increase basically in all countries, as shown in the map on the left. However, very interestingly, the overall disease burden, burden will be less shared by the Western countries because of the decreasing age-specific incidence of dementia in the developed world probably related to improved education, diet, and control of cardiovascular risks. 
In contrast, the age-specific incidence of dementia is still rising in Asia. So magnified by the huge populations, the expected annual percentage change, that is the EAPC in the world map at the right low panel, will be very pronounced in Asia. Take China as an example. Currently, more than 15 million people aged 60 and above have dementia. The prevalence of dementia in China is 788 per 100,000, higher than the world's average of 680. More than 21% of people with Alzheimer's disease are aged below 60 in China. Thus, dementia is striking at an increasingly younger age in China. Compared to people without dementia, demented people have a much higher demand for hospital care, but a poorer outcome despite treatment. The projected annual treatment cost for Alzheimer's disease in China alone will be 1.8 trillion US dollars by 2050. It never rains, but it pours. Asia is also heavily hit by stroke, the main driver of vascular dementia. In this map, you can readily see that China has the highest age standardized stroke incidence in the world. In fact, every 10 seconds, someone in China suffers from a stroke. And in every 28 seconds, someone in China dies from a stroke. China now accounts for at least a quarter of the global stroke mortality. We can see here, while stroke accounts for 6.8% of total mortality in the United States, 20% of overall deaths in China were related to stroke. Moreover, up to 75% of stroke survivors have significant residual disability. This poor clinical outcome suggests that many patients might not have a chance to receive reperfusion treatments that can potentially reverse these disabilities. Furthermore, the huge incidence of 3.4 million new stroke cases in 2020 might imply there's still much room for improvement in terms of risk factor control. But one reassuring fact is 80% of strokes are preventable and 40% of dementia is either preventable or can be delayed. More evidence now supports the 12 potentially modifi modifiable risks for dementia. As shown on the left, these 12 risks are less education, hypertension, hearing impairment, smoking, obesity, depression, physical inactivity, diabetes, low social contact, excessive alcohol consumption, head injury, and air pollution. These 12 factors account for around 40% of worldwide dementia, theoretically be prevented or delayed. As suggested in this Lancet Commission paper, the potential for prevention might be higher in Asia, low-income and middle-income countries where more dementias occur. And interestingly, on the right you can see 10 of these 12 factors are in fact also modifiable risks for stroke. Therefore, if we can reinforce the control of these risks, we can kill two birds with one stone. As I've been serving in a public hospital, I probably have seen good enough patients with established strokes or dementia. It's high time we stepped out of the hospital and advocated primary prevention in the community. This life course model on the right has worldwide policy implication. Actually, I'm quite impressed by the notion that it's never too early or never too late in dementia prevention. We can enhance cognitive reserve through early education, then strengthen control of cardiovascular risk in midlife to minimize trigger of disease. And we should always keep cognitively, physically, and socially active throughout. I'm glad the Chinese government has also acknowledged this and currently, there's a nationwide campaign focusing on adaptation to a healthy lifestyle, an early detection and intervention for vascular cognitive impairment and Alzheimer's disease. Of course, in practice, there are certainly more hurdles we need to overcome. Take, for example, here we see that despite a uniform ac acute stroke air care policy in China, the stroke mortality rate is always much higher in rural areas than in urban regions. I believe, apart from the geographic barriers and the disparity in treatment opportunities, there could be cultural beliefs, poverty, and inequalities leading to a difference in outcome. Sometimes the problems can even be related to the healthcare providers. 
According to a survey of doctors from 21 provinces in China, 60% of doctors do not believe or will not adhere to the new JNC or AHA guideline for blood pressure control, although hypertension contributes to at least one-third of all strokes. Given the gravity of the problem, it is therefore important to set up a brain health cohort to understand the current situation and as a first step to promote brain health in the region. We still remember the press conference held in July 2019. And thank you very much for your visit, Jonathan. We had more than 50,000 responses after that. Hong Kong is at the south coast of China, and we have one of the longest life expectancies in the world, and our population is aging fast. It's our vision that the health span of people could last similarly long as a lifespan and people can live with quality and dignity. In this cohort, we enrolled permanent residents aged 40 to 74 years without any known brain disease. We randomly selected 5,000 people, that is roughly 10% from the responders. This is an epidemiological representative sample from all social economic classes and from all districts of Hong Kong with references to the government census data. And this is our Brain Health Center in the CBD, adjacent to an uh, underground railway station, very convenient for people to visit. You can see here the rooms for investigation, and we even have a nice harbor view. Nevertheless, recruitment was not easy during the social unrest in Hong Kong and the COVID pandemic. The participants underwent a physical examination, a health survey, a quantitative assessment, blood tests, stool analysis for microbiota, uh, carotid duplex ultrasound examination, and retinal artery imaging, and in selected individuals, an MRI brain. This graph shows the distribution by their geographic origin, age, and sex. Recruitment is still ongoing. We are close to 90% of the target by now. But the preliminary findings are quite interesting. Surprisingly, among these supposedly healthy individuals without any brain disease, the preference of cardiovascular risks was unexpectedly high. Two thirds has elevated blood pressure, 26% had frank hypertension, 9% were diabetic, 11% had grossly elevated cholesterol with LDL higher than 155 milligram per deciliter and 50% had carotid plaques on ultrasound examination. For those who had MRI brain, over half of them had small vessel disease. 11% had quite confluent white matter changes as shown here, but all were subclinical. Microbleeds were found in 20% of those with MRI. We employed 24-hour blood pressure monitoring, and in many occasions, Hidden hypertension was revealed, like in this 66-year-old man who had subclinical basal ganglia infarct, but he claimed his blood pressure was always normal. Yes, that's true. During this 48-hour monitoring, his blood pressure was rel relatively normal at the morning measurement, as indicated by the blue arrows. But his, but his blood pressure, but but his blood pressure becomes sky high during the daytime when we worked under pressure. That is the area in red. This variability of blood pressure was commonly observed in people here. Um, we appreciate very much the brain care score developed by the McCann Center. We basically also have obtained all the parameters in this brain care score, except the nutrition component. Therefore, we have up to 19 points without the nutrition information. When we try to correlate the brain care score with the baseline biomarkers in 3,868 subjects, we found the score correlated well with the maximum carotid stenosis. That is, the higher the brain score, the less carotid stenosis. There was also a correlation with the Montreal cognitive test. That is, the higher the brain score, the higher the cognitive score but we need to interpret the linear regression result here with caution, as the R-square values are quite small, indicating wide scattering around the regression line. Um, but we found no correlation between the brain care score with the brain volume in terms of ICV. 
Overall, the sensitivity and specificity are not high for such a cross-sectional analysis, but it would be meaningful to have a longitudinal follow-up and monitor the progression of these biomarkers. Our brain health cohort also gave us an opportunity to perform a study on COVID vaccine safety. We recruited participants just before the pandemic who had no history of COVID infection and no history of COVID vaccination, but we had the MRI brain results and cardiovascular risk results. They were stratified into BioNTech group, CoronaVac group, or unvaccinated group as controls. We prospectively follow them up and perform another set of MRI brain and blood tests after two to three doses of COVID vaccines. Primary outcomes was emerging small vessel disease in MRI, including new microbeats, new microinfarcts, increase in perovascular space, and progression on white matter hyperintensities. With a total of 415 citizens enrolled, the baseline characteristics were comparable between the three groups. Primary outcome occurred in 109 participants. There was no clinical stroke and 60 people contracted COVID infection during the follow-up. And importantly, we found no correlation between COVID vaccines and progression of the small vessel disease. In fact, metabolic risks were a stronger risk of cerebrovascular disease than COVID vaccines. Our results may help clarify the safety concern of vaccines manufactured on an mRNA platform and may reduce vaccine hesitancy in the public. So looking ahead for our brain health cohort, I have two dreams. First, I hope people will eventually realize that wrinkles and damaged brain cells are both irreversible and they could take care of the brain devotedly in the same delicate manner as they prevent wrinkles. And it's the duty of young people to start taking care of their brain when they were healthy. My second dream is, regardless of the life expectancy, people can live contentedly in a world without depression. I understand this dream could be 10 times more difficult to realize than controlling a tangible risk like blood pressure. But after witnessing so many lives and deaths in hospital, I realized that one ultimate purpose of life is to live happily, meaningfully, with no regrets. While we strive to complete the baseline recruitment this year, we're also eager to collaborate and learn from our colleagues who have um, same vision in stroke and dementia prevention. And this was the occasion when we had an exchange with the George Institute. And we have started a meta-analysis and a survey study with our Australian counterpart. And lastly, I would like to thank all study participants, my teammates, especially Anki and Dr. Benavention Yip and the Quartz Foundation for their generous financial support. I hope I'll have another chance to share with you more concrete results in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Thomas. Um, I wonder if we can stop the slide share, uh, screen share for a second so we can all see each other. Okay. Let's see. Is Hira on the line? Yes. Is yeah. that okay now? Are you able to stop the screen share? Um, I don't have a control over that. Ah, there we go. Good. Great. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, well, Thomas, thank you. Uh, it, you know, you've just scratched the surface and all the extraordinary work that you and your team are doing to uh, really figure out how we can achieve the kind of prevention needed mm -hmm. to, to uh, you know, to make your dreams come true. Um, but one of the uh, challenges, I think you're, you know, that last collaborative project with uh, the George Institute hints at is, you know, we enroll these volunteers in, in these research programs, and yet we know that they don't represent, generally speaking, the populations mm -hmm. we most need to help. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts about how, um, you know, the social issues, the social determinants of health in Hong Kong 
at mm -hmm. least, uh, might inform what kinds of interventions ultimately you'd want to make to help the whole population. I see. Um, actually, we intended to recruit people of um, more so lower social economic class in Hong Kong. You know, we have the 5,000 people in Hong Kong from all districts in Hong Kong, including rich people, of course, the those who were volunteer at the beginning could be more active. But in fact, we also um, uh, randomly recruited patient, uh, people from the poor area. I think even with this cohort, we still um, discovered actually a lot of hidden cardiovascular risks harbor in these people. I think um, they could be even more common in those poorer uh, populations. And therefore, we still have a lot of things to do. Actually, at the meantime, uh, I'm liaising with the government because they have a lot of district clinic and they are doing primary care for those people. I think we should reinforce the brain care um, um, program to them. And also the brain care score is very useful, developed by you, and to reinforce those risk factor controls in those th three categories. Very, very important. I think um, hypertension is uh, really the main focus because you see um, over two thirds of them actually have elevated blood pressure without treatment. So, um, and they have um, um, subclinical small vessel disease. And this is so important. We have to need to prevent in the coming decade. I see we have a question from Nelson. Hi. Um, yeah, so thank you. Great presentation. I really enjoyed it. Uh, very informational. My question is, is uh, as a neurologist, uh, what is your opinion on using TPA and like stroke patients? Because I know there's a whole like discussion on like using TPA, whether or not they're better like long term outcomes, but there's also the risk of brain bleeding. So I would like to know your opinion on that. Thank you. I think at acute um, management, um, TPA is, is the proven treatment in those within the time window. As um, in this era, you may also give TNK, and which is now as safe and as effective, particularly in those patients with large vessel occlusion. I think um, I have no reservation in recommending this treatment in those eligible patients. Thank you. Dimitri. Ah, yes. Uh... Thank you, Dr. Leung, for this very nice presentation. I just had a quick question on the diagnosis of dementia. You mentioned that you have a lot of early diagnosis less than 60 years old. Mm -hmm. I was wondering, is this like if comparing to the US, for example, is this because of diagnosis differences between the countries or are you doing like some early presymptomatic diagnosis? Yeah, it's the initial presentation of patients, I would say. When they are symptomatic, the um, yeah, about twenty percent of them actually below the age of eight sixty. And compared to the internationally reported figures of five to ten percent, which is significantly higher in mainland China, and this is what we should um, and, and, and demand our attention. I would say, particularly risk factors, cardiovascular risk factors, and in the early life, in the midlife that may actually trigger the disease and neuropathology, causing early dementia. Thank you. Jean? Hi, uh, Professor Long. Thank you. I, I had not realized um, the epidemiology of, of Asia and the unmet need there. Uh, and I think your presentation really captured that. It's quite striking and alarming in a way. Um, my question is more related around dietary factors Take mm -hmm. sodium intake, you know, here in America, sodium intake is about on average about 3,400 milligrams per day. The mm -hmm. recommendation is, is about 2,300. So, we're, so we're, we're doing a very poor job of managing sodium mm -hmm. intake and, and, and whether or not uh, you have any plans to, to look at dietary intake or modification of diet, or maybe that's difficult in these countries to modify I know that the Lancet Commission left out diet as a major modifiable risk factor, and we actually published a follow-up in the Lancet strictly focused on diet uh, as a modifiable risk factor for stroke and dementia. Um, mm -hmm. 
do you have any plans to 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 look at dietary factors or particular is is sodium intake a, an issue in Asian countries as it is here in the United States? Definitely. Um, the salt intake is much higher, particularly in the northern part of China. You know, in Japan, they all have their their so soy sauce, and which is very salty. Um, and you see, it's really um, the high incidence of hemorrhagic stroke and hypertension in the northern part, corresponding right. to higher salt intake, which is very true, and I totally agree with you. And at the same time, diet is not just salt, and also the potassium intake. There's also studies suggesting more potassium intake, they may actually um, reduce the blood pressure and of course, more excretion of salt perhaps. And so to reduce the hypertension and also also the the the, the stroke, I think is diet should be really a subject because it is, should be a policy maker, uh, policy actually um, for the whole country. I think it would be very important for education as well. Um, but of course, I've been working in hospital. We only treat patients. I think we still need a lot of effort to convince the government that this is important. Thank you. Thomas, if I could ask you uh, on that last, um, your last statement, a lot of effort to convince the government that it's this is important. Mm. Um, you know, we, you, you're part of these discussions as well. There are all these international bodies and these high profile international conferences. I think even the G7 or G8 in October, there's going to be a session on dementia. Certainly at the UN, there's a lot of talk. Why is it, do you think that still, despite all of this, we have to work so hard to develop government policies, even in a place like Hong Kong and China, where the government really has a great deal of autonomy control mm -hmm. to actually take action. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think um, I had a chance to to present the burden of stroke in the World Economics Forum once a few years ago. I mean, it's really difficult to convince the politicians. I mean, they have a lot of agenda. I mean, certainly, I don't know st whether stroke or health is really at the top of their priority. Um, but we had also a chance to convince the government officials in China. Now they have a program um, to implement more centers, for example, doing the mechanical thrombectomy, make sure it's widely accessible to people in the um, in the rural areas. And they have a campaign by um, um, 2030, as I've just mentioned, to reduce the um, cognitive dementia, uh, the vascular cognitive dementia, as well as the early detection of Alzheimer's disease, and to reduce the mortality and the incidence of stroke in, in China. I think they're the very good initiatives. You know, when China doing more authoritatively, probably they have higher chance of success. But for, um, for other governments, I would say, um, there are so many other agenda in the, um, in the, in the list and they may not take stroke or health of, of people um, at the top priority. I think um, there should be a change. And do you find that um, it's the economics that persuades yeah. governments? You mean the- um... Like the cost, the, the cost <laughs> of the economy. I mean, you know, we, we often use that as our, what we think of as the sort of the best way to help mm -hmm. politicians get motivated. I, yes, I, yes, yes. I mean, when the government pay for people like in Hong Kong, yes, the cost may convince them. But if the insurance company or if um, they are really used health as an as an agenda to attack the, the other parties, so it could be quite difficult. I mean, when they use it as a bargain for, 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 for their, their polit polit political benefit, then it could be really difficult in that situation. Uh, Hiroko. I think you're muted. Yeah, thank you for the nice presentation of the epidemiological studies in China. It's um, very nice to hear this kind of large studies going on in Hong Kong. Uh, one question I have is the social connectedness. So, in um, in Western countries like Lancet Commission, 
4% of dementia cases can be prevented by reducing social isolation. And I always feel that sort of based on Western countries' perspective, more individualized, mm. and then once kids grown up, parents can be, you know, out of their sight, uh, yeah. their individual uh, lifestyle. So do you feel in like China, the Lancet study can be applicable because more um, aged people, older people are more respected in the family and the more harmonized mm -hmm. um, larger family setting is preferred. Um, but at the same time, you know, time is shifting and then they might feel more isolated because culturally they feel they has to be involved in a younger family's uh, responsibility, you know, care for kids stuff. But then in reality, younger people move out and then so they feel more isolated. How do you feel like social connectedness uh, between Asian country right now versus Western countries? Mm -hmm. I mean, families in Asia or in China, are definitely smaller, much smaller than a decade ago. Now, people may only have one or two children at most. And so they usually have empty nest syndrome. Um, they now people, I mean, in, just like, for example, in Hong Kong, um, I myself don't even know the short name of my neighbor. So they have less connection between neighborhoods. Unlike in the old days, where actually people um, know the whole whole peoples in the in the same villages, so it's kind of an isolation. But um, I think um, the Hong Kong government, as well as the many centers in China, and trying to reverse this by setting up a lot of elderly centers in the communities, and at the same time doing health practice there, that people now um, joining the singing class can they have Tai Chi class. And they have the even the um, English class, even in the in the elderly center, and we have a lot of these centers setting up, um, binding people, elderly people, and they have uh, friends uh, development there, and they're more social uh, contact, and they maintain their active life cognitively at least, and therefore this may actually um, reverse the social isolation um, um, because of these very small families and the emptiness syndrome. Uh, it's, it's possible. Yeah. Thank you. It would be nice to, since you have a, such a nice epidemiological cohort, it would be nice to duplicate like Lancet to Commission's figures, how, you know, each uh, risk factor, modifiable risk factor uh, can be different, you know, across the regions. That would be very interesting to see. Yeah, very interesting. Thank you. Other questions? Thomas, maybe you could talk a little bit about the role of supplements in the population um, that uh, you care for, because I remember from my visits to Hong Kong, there is so much uh, practice of, uh, you know, using different types of teas or, or other, uh, you know, over the counter um, items to preserve and enhance health. And I wonder what role they play in all of this. You mean tra traditional Chinese medicine? Yes. Yes, it's, and it's getting more and more common nowadays, um, but still slightly um, different from, from the mainland China practice. Um, the uh, Chinese medicine practitioner and the Western uh, medicine practitioner are still in separate hospitals in Hong Kong. So um, for stroke patients, for example, they may visit um, the Chinese medicine practitioner after discharge from our hospital. But now we are not actually combining this practice. We invited the, um, the, the, the Chinese practicing med med people to come for acupuncture in the acute um, setting and may even invite them to have some herbal med medications know not to cause an interaction with our drugs and even given uh, to the patient at the acute stage. So there are more and more integration happening um, between the Chinese and also Western medicine and um, is, is evolving. But um, we are still um, need some time 
to establish the role of each ingredient of Chinese medicine or their health medicine, um, because and they have a different evidence. Um, uh, I mean, they 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 gather that evidence from the experience. Unlike in Western practice, we we did a lot of research and randomized study, for example, to convince people that they are actually of value. But they they actually, I mean, um, in many Western world, they, in the laboratory, sometimes they may they may able to extract some useful ingredients from these Chinese uh, traditional medicine, saying, oh, this could be in, a, in a, on a cellular level may help actually some metabolism. So I think they, this could be a treasure that we have more collaboration, be able to identify this and put them into clinical studies and hopefully they can be, um, can, can be more evidence to support their use in the future. Yeah, that's, that does seem like a promising opportunity. And um, mm. I know that uh, there is some overlap, but it would be interesting to know if some of the, um, you know, the non-pharmacologic supplements yeah. that uh, Jean and uh, Rudy Tanzi are looking at might have overlap with what is being used mm. in traditional Chinese medicine. Yeah, I would say, and I'm sorry I'm driving, so it's a little difficult, but I really enjoyed your talk, Thomas. And many of the natural product hits, we've screened about 2,500 natural products, including many uh, Chinese medicine products and Ayurvedic products in mm -hmm. our, um, our 3D uh, uh, neuroculture and neuroglial culture and brain organoid models of Alzheimer's that have been championed by Du Yan Kim and screens by Louisa Kinti. And I would say some of the more successful hits do bring us back to Chinese medicine. And um, and in fact, the first trials that Gene and I will be doing on combinations of natural products that look like based on lab results, mul maybe multimodal and synergistic, um, we'll, we'll focus on some Chinese uh, medicine mm. products that, are, that, that cross over into Ayurvedic as well. Mm. So... Um, yeah, more, more to come on that. <laughs> and that's fascinating. Great and I have a, a question from the chat from Dr. Shamali. Um, in low and middle income countries, smoking is huge and a root cause for many vascular risk factors leading mm -hmm. to stroke and dementia. And she was wondering about the role of smoking in the populations that you're studying and caring for. <laughs> I'm not an, an expert in this aspect. There's certainly smoking, passive smoking, and also air pollution. Now, we all, often have, um, you know, in the Lancet Commission paper, they have the uh, the PM um, 2.5 as air pollutant, mm -hmm. as the prominent um, risk factor for stroke now. I mean, these are going to be uh, very significant in the future. And even in the carotid plaque, we found the plastic there. So... Um, so there are more and more studies suggesting pollution, air pollution, smoking will be huge um, uh, impact, particularly in the developing countries where the smoking, um, the, the, the preference is still rising. I just want to come back to something you said that caught my attention. Did you say that you've identified microplastics in the carotid plaque? No, I've just read a, a paper from New England Journal of Medicine recently. Oh. They said they... they um, uh, have their, 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 those tiny plastics found in those patients with the, with the um, ulcerative plaques in the carotid artery. Oh it's very my. Yeah. Yes, it is. Oh, boy. <laughs> oh boy. And, and we're starting to look at how microplastics yes. might affect um, Alzheimer's pathology and the organoid models as well. Yeah, very interesting. Very yeah. Best <laughs> to have uh, some specimen. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, well, if not, then Thomas, I will just say thank you very much for an incredibly stimulating presentation. We look forward to many more results to come and, and, and uh, a fruitful continued collaboration. Uh, mm -hmm. It's great to see you and, and thank you so much for, for staying up late uh, yeah. uh, to, to, to join to... us. Yeah, we, we, are, we really so appreciate much. it. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Looking forward to meeting you soon. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Thomas. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye. Bye.
拜拜。